May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts, may they be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. O grace, mercy, and peace be yours this day from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. The text for this morning's meditation comes to us from our Old Testament lesson in Judges chapter 2. Uh, things a little bit different today. That's only because we're going to be going through quite a few verses. I thought it might be a little quicker to do it this way rather than kind of going back and forth. So uh, maybe I'll be able to see you kind of going back and forth too. That'll be fun also, right? Uh, but here we are in Judges chapter 2, and we really didn't get a lot of time to celebrate the victory. <coughs> if you were to have read through Joshua, and I hope you did, not just the story. We have seen all of the battles and all of the victory and all the success that Israel had because God was with them. And see, that's really the important part when you think about it. God was with them. If God was not with Israel, they would have not, they would not have won even one battle. We saw what happened 40 years prior when God wasn't with them. They lost. But really, we don't have much time to celebrate the victory because there wasn't really a lot of time to celebrate. It didn't take long for things to change. If you can remember from the book of Deuteronomy, Moses gave uh, the Israelites all kinds of commandments, the laws and rules, things that they were to remember. Now, one of the things he said was when you win a battle, you are able to take the plunder and even take some of the people to be servants and the like. Except, except Deuteronomy chapter 20. Except in the cities of these people that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance. You shall stabilize what? Nothing. Nothing that breathes. But you shall devote them to complete destruction. Any other time in battle, they can keep what God gives them, including the people as servants. But when it comes to the people of the land they're going to, they were to destroy and kill everyone. Remember, there's a reason why God picks this land. These people are filled with sinfulness and sinful behavior. And God knows if you leave just a little bit left, a little snare, the Israelites will fall. In fact, the book of James says, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. I think we can look at it the other way as well. If you leave a little taste, a little snare, a little foothold, the devil will find his way in. And you know what? That is exactly what happens in the book of Judges. What do we find in chapter 1? Manasseh did not drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shean. Ephraim did not drive out the Canaanites who lived in Gezer. Zebulon did not drive out the inheritance of Kitron. And, and guess what about the rest of the Israelites? You know what they did? They didn't drive them out. We played this game before, right? The Canaanites dwelt among them. And as a result, just as God predicted, just as God said would happen, they forgot about the Lord. And they started worshiping false idols. False idols. And what we're going to start to see is this cycle. The people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. They forgot the Lord their God. They served the Baal and the Asherahs. Canaan's God, which we'll talk about in Sunday school, ah, there's a little tidbit, come to Sunday school. Uh, therefore, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, right? The anger was there. And that's the cycle. They don't worship God. God is angry. They become oppressed. They cry out to God. A judge is sent. Now, you think with the cycle, that would start going up, right? That Israel will get better and better and learn from what has happened. But instead, it's quite opposite. It starts to go down. The people become worse 
and worse. Even the judges get a little quirky, so to speak, right? I mean, this isn't good, so we're eventually at the end of the book of Judges, we see that everyone is doing what is right in their own eyes. And when people are doing right what is in their own eyes, that's basically another way of saying they are chasing the forbidden fruit. They are going after what they know is not really theirs, but it feels good, it sounds good, it looks good, and if it's right in their eyes, they're going to do it. That doesn't sound like anything that goes on today in society, does it? No, for sure, it's not that at all. So what happens? God sends a judge. Who are these judges? What do you think about when you think of judges? <laughs> That's really not what we want to have in mind when we think of the judges of the Bible, okay? Not somebody who is really deciding between what is right and wrong, or even looking at the laws of God, deciding to keep it or not. He's not deciding between two people. It's not a case of litigation. What a better way to think of these judges, they're Samson, right? As the Bible says, he takes that fresh donkey bone and he kills 1,000 people. I love how they have the adjective fresh donkey bone, because that matters, right? Take the donkey bone and kills a thousand people. Incredible training. When you think about a judge, think about a mighty warrior. Think about somebody who God uses to restore God's judgment. God's justice. Basically what that means is he's going to wipe out all of those who are oppressing Israel. I would love to talk about all of the judges, Samson and Ehud and Shamgar, he's my favorite one, but I think for us today, the best one for us to talk about is Gideon. Now there are all kinds of pictures of Gideon that, that show his strength, as if he's a mighty warrior. But you know what? I chose that one for a reason. Think about Gideon when he was called. If you were to go into the marketplace and say, uh, I'm sorry, but can you tell me where Gideon is? People would say, who? The lowest of the low? That's what he would tell God when he was called. In fact, where, what was he doing when God was calling him? He was hiding his food, his crops in the wine press, so that the people ruling over him wouldn't find his stuff. He's from the lowest of the low, the lowest tribe, the lowest family. He was the lowest in his family. That's what he said. You see, that just screams Jacob May, by the way. And my guess is you can relate. When you think about celebrities and people who are influential, people who are, are popular, who am I? If you were to go to Walmart or Target and say, did you hear Pastor Jacob May's sermon, people are going to say, Pastor who? <laughs> what sermon, right? I can relate to that. Really, a nobody. But even worse than that, think about that one. <coughs> yes, the families we come from or the sinfulness that we carry into our families, or the things that we brought to our confession, and the next thing we know, we're like, oh, we're not like Gideon. We are like the people that Gideon was sent to break out of the oppression. We are the ones crying out, Lord, save me. Because we are the ones like Israel, chasing after something else other than the Lord God. Constantly looking for what can satisfy my need now? What can satisfy my attention span now? What is it that I can use to spend my time on now? What will satisfy and fulfill? And then finally we get to the point where we say, oh yeah, God, God, help me. Right? That's us. That's who we are. And we cry out, Lord, send a judge. For the oppression is too much. But did you see it? Or, or better yet, have you seen it? When you, walk, when you go to the book of Judges, pick a judge for the most part, 
you find that the judge is able to be raised up because of the Spirit. It's the Spirit of God that clothes Gideon who gives him the courage. It's the Spirit of God that gives Samson his strength and Deborah her wisdom and Shamgar his might. Seriously, look at all these great. It's the Spirit of God that goes upon these people to do the work. Now, did you see it in your epistle lesson for today, or I should say in the lesson in Acts? It's the Spirit of God that comes upon Jesus Christ. The Spirit of God in the Gospel is baptism. You see it descending like a dove. And what does he do? He fights the battle. The greatest battle. The battle that no man has ever been able to fight. He goes off into the wilderness and he says no to the devil. <laughs> no, I will not turn these stones into bread. No, I will not jump off of the temple and tempt the Lord. No, I'm not going to bow down and worship you. No. Without even lifting a finger, he wins the battle. In fact, his finger is lifted for him as he goes to the cross and suffers and dies. And that's what's so great about this. If you look at the judges, whenever the judge is living, Israel is good. As soon as the judge dies, everything goes down to him. As Jesus lives and gets toward the end of his life, things go wrong, right? A lot of chaos, a lot of fighting, a lot of anger in Israel. But as soon as Jesus dies, really see the power of God as he raises them from the dead and saves people like Gideon, saves people like you and me, and calls us his children. But what about today? Does anybody here see oppression in the world around us? Anybody here see Heartache? Can you find somebody who's disgruntled? Or maybe someone who's in shame, living with shame and guilt? Or marriage that's on the rock? Can we find these people in our society today? You see, the reality is people are hurting and they don't even realize it. They are crying out for a deliverer. So I want to know who is God going to send? Who is God going to raise up to proclaim His good work in a world that desperately needs to hear it? You know what I think? I think we have a word from God today. No one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the what? Holy Spirit. Spirit. If you believe that Jesus is Lord, the Holy Spirit is working in you. That's, that's biblical. If you believe that Jesus is Lord, can you say Jesus is Lord? Yes, Jesus is Lord. Lord. If you really believe that Jesus is, is Lord, can you say Jesus is Lord? Jesus is Lord. Jesus. You're the ones. You're the ones that God is going to raise up. And it might not be something like, like Samson or Gideon, though it may. It may be just a simple word of encouragement that changes the heart. That's a big deal. That's eternity for somebody. God is choosing you to raise you up to speak a word of encouragement to your co-worker. Or to talk to that individual who's really struggling with his marriage. Teach him about a covenant. God is going to raise you up to proclaim his kingdom in the world around you. And it's not about you. It's not about your strength. It's not about your ability. It's about the Spirit. And you've already proven that the Spirit is at work in you. Don't shut him up. Don't shut him out. Don't say, I can't do it. Instead, may the Holy Spirit be seen in you that our world, our culture, our country might be saved and delivered. Amen. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, 
gave our hearts and minds and the judge, our deliverer, Jesus Christ. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time that we had together today. We pray that your word would inspire us, your Holy Spirit would remain with us as we depart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. At this time, I invite you to rise as we confess the faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. Nice